It also makes it, the nice thing about this is it also makes it clear how the Renormalon relates to the Landau pole. So we'll see that as well. So take our solution for the RG, which we could write in terms of this integral. And let's consider what this integral actually is doing in the complex T plane. So the T's are negative. And so they look like this. The Landau pole, where the coupling blows up, is where the t goes to 0. So the Landau pole is at the origin. Okay, So this is what the complex t plane looks like. And what we're doing when we do the integral is we're just doing an integral over that little range here, right? So we're far away from the Landau pole, and that's why everything was nicely convergent. And connect one mass to another. But you could ask, what happens if I take this t0 and I move it somewhere else in this, in this picture? And that's what we're going to do. So let's consider the limit where r0 goes to 0. If r goes to 0 and you look back at the formula that we had that converts between the ms bar mass and this m of r, you'll see that m of r0 goes to m pole, because we had a power of r times a series of alpha of r's, which are just logs of r. The power always wins. And so the mass goes to the pole mass in that limit that r0 goes to 0. And if you look at what t0 is, t0 is related to the coupling, which I could write in terms of a log of lambda qcd. And t0 is basically, in this limit, going to plus infinity. So what happens is, if I want to get back to the pole mass from one of these masses, I basically have to take this guy and move out to infinity, which means I have to make a choice about going around that Landau pole. Basically, you're taking your RGE and you're pushing it into a region that's where you're no longer completely perturbative, and that you're forced to continue by the Landau pole. Now, you can actually avoid the Landau pole by going. Far, you know, it's true that the series becomes non-perturbative in this region, but you, you could go way up here <laughs> and come back over there. So you can, actually you can actually formally stay in a region in the complex plane where your perturbation theory is still applicable. But you still have to decide which way you're going to go around it. And so that introduces a, an ambiguity. So doing that, say we go above or something, and if you plug in in this result the, the lowest order leading log result, you get this integral. And this integral, you know, you have to go around the t equals 0 pole, because t1 is negative. So it turns out that you can actually take this integral, and I'm going to leave this for your problem set.
and write it in the form of a, a Borel integral. With an exponential, that's exactly the Borel transform variable. If I just change a variable from t to u, so that I get this integral. And if you do that, what you find is that f of u is proportional to 1 over u minus 1 half. What's the logarithm here? Zero. Okay, so you can actually see that the RGE and what was the Landau pole here is effectively in this integral here becoming this Borel pole at u equals a half. And that makes it a little more clear the fact that these poles are related to the non perturbative physics that's in the coupling in the the infrared physics. So formally, this actually allows you to set up a method of trying to find the renormal on. Because you can just do this continue, you can ask, given some series, if I, if I sort of construct this thing, what if I just, I have this attitude that we want to pick that series to cancel a renormal on. Now take the attitude, what if we didn't know that that series had a renormal on? I could still throw it in, make a change of variable to some mass, if it's a convergent series, then I'm just defining some new mass. And I could go through this technology, and it, would turn, it should turn out that if, uh, if the series was OK, so to speak, then you wouldn't find this renormal on. You wouldn't find a, a pole there. And that can be, I won't go through this in detail because it, does, it is a bit tricky to derive. But you can derive what's called a sum rule for the renormal on which is another way of probing it, by basically taking our all-order all solution. So I took our leading log solution here, right? If I did the same thing with the all-order solution, I could also take the Borel transform of that. And that, if I do that, gives me this thing called a sum rule. It's just manipulating infinite series, and Mathematica can sum some of them up for you. So, it's just tedious. And what you find is a formula for the residue of the Borel pole. Well, let me call that residue p1 half. And the, the answer is actually pretty simple. So these S's were these coefficients that were showing up in our solution for the all orders RGE. P1 half is a series which will tell me the residue of the pole. So that means that if P1 half is not equal to zero, then you have a U equals a half pole. And if P1 half is equals zero, then you have no u equals a half pole. Now, in practice, you don't have an all-orders result. You only know a not finite number of these s's. So what you actually do is you look at this series and you try to figure out where it's converging to. Okay? But actually, even with the knowledge that we have of the, of the series, for example, for the B quark mass, you can very quickly see that it has a u equals a half pole. And you can even do some error analysis by varying some things in your get some kind of idea of the theoretical uncertainty from higher order terms in the series. If you just formally say, take a series that's convergent, 
you could calculate, if I hand you a series that's convergent, you can calculate all these SKs. And then you can very easily see that actually there's no U equals a half pole. What happens is that all the terms are canceling in this series, and you just get 0. Okay, so it's kind of like the cancellations I was talking about, where I was canceling a pole in the, in the anomalous dimension, but here it's happening in this thing, if I have a convergent series. So this is a way of probing for renormal ons, which doesn't rely on the bubble sum, and it basically uses the perturbative information that you have available, whether it's non-abelian or abelian information. Yep. Um, so when you did the, um, well, this calculation here, that capital F, does, is it the same result as we found like a week and a half ago or something that has like the renormal the renal of u equals one and all that stuff as so, well? Um, no, yeah. it's just the u equals the half pole. Uh, only yeah. yeah. So, right. So. What we've done here, and actually I'm just going to come to this, but I'll foreshadow. So what we've done here is we set up a construction to remove the u equals a half pole. And we did not remove any higher poles. So you could, we said the u equals a half is the most important. Let's get rid of that one from the MS bar mass. There would be, in principle, higher ones. And higher ones would, it basically, we, we had a, something that was proportional to r. If you wanted to remove, for that's for u equals a half, if you want to remove higher ones, you'd need terms proportional to r squared, for example, for u equals 1, et cetera. So we could have added more terms to do more, but we didn't. We just sort of removed the problem at u equals a half, and that's why when we go through this, you only see a u equals a half pole. So if you want to do the all analysis or something, you'd have to change the result of this. Yeah, so you, you, the way you should think about it is that basically what you're doing is you're setting up a scheme change that perturbatively takes you out of MS bar towards something else, you, you remove the u equals a half and you get rid of that problem. If you thought you had enough perturbative accuracy that you were seeing problems related to u equals 1, then you could make further scheme change with another series that's proportional to r squared to get rid of that one. Okay, so the final poll would tell you about all the real ones. It would tell you about these ones too, yeah, absolutely. So you can actually generalize this for r, you know, for r to the p, and you can derive a sum rule for r to the p, and it's a slightly more complicated formula here, and then you'd have the p to p over 2 <laughs> pole. All right. OK, so the sum rule is a probe, alternate probe for the renormal on. The NF bubbles are the classic one that people know about. And this provides an alternate. The nice thing about this is it also provides a series that, can, that you can look at the convergence, where the NF bubbles just get a result. So the NF bubbles are good for finding out whether or not this thing has a renormal on. If you get some non-zero result, then you expect that it does. This way, you could actually calculate the residue if you, thought, if you wanted to know that value for some reason. OK. And that actually might be useful, for example, if you wanted to think about higher renormal on poles, because you might want to say, well, let me get rid of the first one with whatever residue I can best approximate it for and see if there's another one underneath. There's not really enough perturbative information that we have about QCD to be able to do that type of thing. There's a few cases where u equals a half is absent. And then you can do that kind of thing. I mean, there's actually many cases where u equals a half is absent, and you can look for u equals 1. But looking for a subleading renormal on is something that nobody's found one. <laughs> People sometimes speculate about them. But <laughs> because maybe the residue of the first one happens to be small. <laughs> this would allow you to test for that. In tau decays, people talk about that. 